I'm Professor Bob Graham at the Victor Chang Cardiac Research Institute. I'm also a cardiologist at St. Vincent's Hospital here in Sydney. Um, we, a lot's happened since I last did these videos for you. And I, I really want to thank you for sending in all your questions. And I hope that you found the previous video helpful. Today, I'd like to address some of the scientific issues related to COVID and heart disease. Um, because I'm sure a lot of you have a lot more questions. And while I can't answer all of them specifically, only in general terms, I hope that you find them helpful. Research is really important if we're going to address COVID. We are, in a sense, at war, and we can't withdraw all the troops. I think it's important that we continue to do research to try and find new ways to tackle this horrible pandemic. Uh, broadly speaking, one question may be what research is currently being conducted into COVID and heart disease. So let me address that in a number of ways. We now know that a, a small percentage of people who get very severe COVID can get involvement of the heart, although in most cases the problem is the lungs and the heart sec suffers secondarily. Yeah. However, there are some areas where heart disease or heart conditions and COVID really intersect very strongly. Some of you may have heard that there are tablets that we use, drugs that we use to treat autoimmune diseases. And these have been suggested will be helpful in COVID. That's still unproven, it's all anecdotal and we need to do proper trials. And one of the problems is one of the drugs that's been recommended can cause an irregularity of the heart. In fact, it can cause a a heart to stop. So you've got to be very careful before you start taking treatments like this before they're proven. So please be careful if you have heard about these treatments and you may want to try them, please don't do that unless you first consult your GP or your cardiologist, particularly if you've got underlying heart disease. Another question you might have is how important is medical research? And I think I've tried to address that. It's absolutely critical if we're going to make advances. One of the advances we're trying to work on and, and help with is what happens to those people who've got very severe respiratory distress syndrome or severe disease. Uh, and they, we know that when you get to a point where you've got very bad lung disease, you've only got about a 50% chance of surviving. We also know that in the, those people, they get marked activation of their immune cells and it starts to attack not only the virus, but also normal cells in the heart. So, and in the lungs, obviously. Uh, and what we're trying to do is to use a stem cell approach to dampen down that hyperimmune re response. And anecdotally, we've had now three patients who have all done very well. Uh, so we're optimistic, but we're still very early days and we need to get these protocols in and start to look at this sort of stem cell treatment in a very sophisticated and proper tr trialed way so that we know the results at the end really mean something and we're not doing more harm than good. That's the way that clinical trials work. Another question you might have is experts keep referring to this as SARS. SARS stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Distress. And you've probably heard about that. That was an epidemic that happened a few years ago. This is a different virus, although it's very related to SARS. In fact, it's called COVID-2. SARS -CoV so it's, it's a cousin of SARS. It causes a different disease, not as severe as SARS, which kills many people very quickly and is in a sense a stupid virus because it, once it's killed people, it's no longer got anywhere to go and so it dies. There's nothing for it to do. This COVID virus, a coronavirus that we have at the moment, is what I call the Cinderella virus. It's perfect. It kills a few people, but it has enough people to keep on infecting others. And it also is really nasty because it can be spread before people know they have symptoms. So in a sense, it, has, it is a virus that has worked out the best way to keep going and to infect as many people as possible. So Although it's not as severe in terms of the ability to go on and cause bad disease and maybe even death as SARS, it's certainly severe enough and it uh, has the ability to infect people before you even know you've got the disease. So that's the difference between SARS 
and coronavirus or COVID-19. COVID uh, are the mortality rates higher than we expected or initially thought? I think the jury's still out. Uh, mortality rates, of course, depend upon how many people have the disease and die versus how many people have the disease and don't die. Now, we know fairly accurately how many people have the disease and die. What we don't know is how many people have the disease and don't die. And what we really need, and this is where research is so important, we need to have a blood test so we can test very quickly whether or not somebody has had uh, a, a coronavirus. And then we will know accurately how many people have had the disease, and then we can determine what the death rate is. What we do know, however, already today is that people who are elderly, those who've got comorbidities such as heart disease uh, or diabetes or are who are immunosuppressed, they do worse and they have a much higher death rate than normal healthy people. We also know, fortunately, that the very young seem to do very well and only have mild disease and there are very, very few deaths in people who are young. But still, don't forget that most people are at between 30 and 50, so the majority of people who get this disease will uh, be in that age range. And we know that 80% will do well, 14% will have a fairly severe disease, and 6% will have a very, very severe disease that will require intensive care uh, treatment. So we've got a lot of people being affected, so we're gonna need a lot of treatment and a lot of ICU beds. And what we wanna try and do is what's called flattening the curve. And that is to slow down the infection, hopefully stop it altogether, so that medical treatments such as hospitals can keep up with the demand. If we have too much demand too quickly, what's called a surge, then we won't be able to treat some people because we won't have enough ventilators and ICU beds. So it's very, very important that you practice social distancing, wash your hands, do all the things we can to reduce the amount of infection. And to put that into some numerical terms, there's a, a, a value that's used in epidemiology called the R zero. So that's the amount of, in a sense, the amount of infectivity. So the common flu has an R zero of about 1.3. And what that means is that if you have the common flu, you will infect on average 1.3 other people. And each one of those 1.3 people will infect another 1.3 people. And if you do that 10 times, you will have one person who started with a common flu will have infected 14 people. Now, if the R0 is 2.2, which is what has been suggested to be for coronavirus, for COVID-19, then in, after 10 times, rather than having 14 people, you now have infected 300 people. So you can see how the ability of this virus to spread is potentially really a problem. If on the other hand, the R0 is three, rather than 2.2 or 1.4, I think most of you'll be surprised to learn that after 10 occurrences like that, you will now not have infected 14 people, you will not have infected 300 people, you will have had infected 40,000 people. And some people say the R0 for coronavirus is three. Uh, I think most people think it's lower than that, fortunately. But what we've got to try and do by social distancing is get that R0 to less than one so that we're not passing it on. So I can't stress how important it is to practice social distancing, wash your hands, self-isolation if you've got the disease, and keep yourself as healthy as you can. So look, thank you very much again for all your support and for your interesting questions. And I hope that we can keep going on these videos in the future. Thanks very much again.